I wouldn't advise using that for very low level bugs, or especially timing bugs, just don't use printf to debug those. Um, it, actually, it can be pretty useful for like high level stuff. Um, on the other hand, that's the kind of bugs you, you, should, you should catch in <laughs> unit tests or in code that runs on the host before you go over to the device. Um, you can also log using, uh, I mean, just not text that you can trace, but you can also use, in my case, I use MIDI. I send out MIDI notes for different states, so I hear like melodies, depending on what happens. And if the melody goes wrong, I, I can put them on minor scales and chords and stuff. So I can <laughs> if it sounds bad, then probably something is wrong. So that's pretty, it's pretty nice as well. And depending on the device you use, the, the kind of channel you have, if, you, if you're building a DMX device, you can just like kind of show patterns and then see immediately if it's green. OK, then it's, it's not good. Um, so there's a lot of creative stuff you can do with logging and printing, actually. Um, and of course, what you can use is using JTAG or PDI or debug wire in the AVR case to uh, actually um, read out the internal state of the device, write it also as well. You can set breakpoints, you can read out the memory, you can write the memory, and basically uh, hook up a debugger to your, to your device. So you, you basically use an external adapter and then use some bridge to GDB and then use GDB to interact with the hardware. So it's basically as, as, you, as if you were running a program in a debugger on the PC. Uh, the bad thing about it is that GDB is not very clever about using the JTAG resources of the, of the Atmel. So it has just like four breakpoints, I think, and one memory breakpoint. And if you start your single step, it will pretty quickly overflow those breakpoints, and it will just like take five seconds to do a single instruction step. So you start, you, you start pretty cheerfully debugging your code, and then just like step. And next step, and then just like, okay, screw this, it's, it's not working. Um, so what I actually did is build, uh, is take the JTAG capability of, um, of this JTAG to GDB bridge and add JavaScript on top of it. So basically just use the JTAG primitives and add JavaScript to it. And the JavaScript debugger can now also parse ELF, um, ELF debug information to look up like which variables define at this line at which part in the memory. And that's actually much, much faster than using GDB for, uh, for that kind of stuff. So you can basically put in a, a breakpoint of a speci specific function and tell the JavaScript to just um, log the register status to a file, and then later on going back to the file and seeing what happened. And it's just much, much more lightweight than GDB and basically makes your device pretty usable. It's going to hang a bit, but it's not like the GDB stuff where you just, you, you just stop doing it after 10 minutes. Um, so this JavaScript debugger is actually a pretty involved thing as well. It's also in the, in the Git repository. It's a bit usable, but if, if somebody is interested, I think the code is pretty clear. Uh, and it's actually pretty nice to just like do custom debug environments for the, the uh, it can parse C++ structures, so you can just like basically interact with C++ structures from the JavaScript. Um, and now the funniest part is stress testing devices. Well. Is a <laughs> Um, it's actually hardware, a lot of bugs come from the hardware itself, um, and especially in the MIDI controller case where you're using it in the techno club at four in the morning in, you know, with strobos going on and, and everybody sweating. It's actually pretty useful to, uh, to test the device for physical abuse first, and you, you have a lot of test environments that are pretty, pretty um, expensive, like companies do that for CE testing and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the, the testing you can actually do for low cost at home. So, for example, if, you, if you're testing for temperature, temperature, like if the electronics is going to work at certain temperatures, if the casing is going to take the physical stress, if it goes hot and then cold, uh, stuff like that, you can just basically put your device in the oven and let it run at 80 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Celsius and basically look what's going to go first. In my case, it was always the Chinese display that would just like stop working at first. Uh, so you can basically put it in, in the oven, then put it in the fridge, then put it in the freezer, then put it in the oven back again, stuff like that. It's pretty, it's pretty cheap, and it shows you if like you do it five times and this screw breaks, you know, okay, maybe I need to up the tolerance on this one a bit. Uh, you can do vibration testing as well. Um, the best I found is just put it on a subwoofer in a club. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we can use like your washing machine or a car, like every, everything you have. Um, the mill is pretty good as well. <laughs> and just let it on there for three days and then see if, if something broke afterwards or, or um, stuff like that. Static, static discharge testing, you can do that pretty easily with a piezo lighter. You just take out the piezo and it produces like 15 kilovolt spikes. 
I just take this one and zap the device at the different points of entry from the casing. Um, in this case as well, it was the, the Chinese display that would go at first all the time. And I actually had to fix the PCB of every single display because it's just weirdly done. Um, but it's pretty, pretty nice to check out stuff. And, and it's, it, it's pretty incredible the amount of abuse the AVR can take. You. Like you can zap, uh, you can zap 15 kilovolt spikes into the, into the clock input and it will continue to run and all that kind of funny stuff. Um, and of course, what you can do is just like kick abuse it and then, you know, just like try to break it and actually go as far as possible to break it to see what, what's, what's the, the breaking point. Um, and another thing you can do with stress testing is if you have protocol inputs like communication channels, it's just like using fuzzing from, from the security approach, just like sending a lot of random data or just like kind of crafting careful, uh, careful packets. Basically, as if you wanted to own it and you go with that kind of same mentality and it, it makes just for pretty robust uh, embedded firmware. I don't think a lot of people are doing this because when you start to, to take, for example, MIDI fuzzing, I started to, to just like check out different synthesizers, what they would do. And I think not a single one could take the abuse, which are all just locked up in different kind of ways. Um, and, and what you can do on a software kind of uh, way to test out delays and interrupts and it's just add, um, add delays to your interrupt routines, for example, so to simulate like kind of big load and see that it's going to stop working at this moment in this way if, um, if basically it just takes too much time to execute and then you can know how much basically buffer you have before it starts uh, missing interrupts, for example, or you start missing bytes. If you have like a, a communication channels, just like try to fuzzy them at the, the full speed and see how much if it's going to work, if it's just going to hang, if it's going to crash, and, and um, basically adjust the, the code that way. Um, so that was basically all the stuff I discovered in this one year. And uh, as I said, it didn't show any kind of technical detail. But I have a few blog posts on my, on my website where I show like, lots of assembler dumps. And this is uh, why G++ is bad, or that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. You can check it out at, uh, oops at reinvasion.com and the whole code is available at GitHub. The JavaScript debugger I think is on there as well, I'm not sure. I've got the whole CAD, CNC software that generates the, the PCBs with test points and all that kind of stuff um, is there as well. And you can, you can follow me on Twitter, ask me questions there. Um, so are there any questions? <laughs> I, I wonder if there's a way to stop that. But, uh. Okay, so you can come up up here. I have a mic, or there's one uh, back there. Have you tried to use an AM radio set for debugging? I was asked if I ever used uh, an AM radio set for debugging, but I, I didn't. No. It's similar to the PSO. Yeah, I think so. Like using audio stuff is pretty nice because you you can always focus on a, on a different thing. Um. Any other questions about C++? Oh. <laughs> um, my question is not about C++, it's about your test environment. Um, I was a bit confused at the beginning when you said uh, you could build, I, I thought it was an emulator for all of the interfaces and then do unit testing against uh, the emulator. Uh, is that what you were doing? Uh, no, what I'm doing at the moment is using, uh, um, the question was um, if I'm using an emulator for the unit testing what I'm actually doing at the moment is using mock objects. So I have like this UART object, and I have a special version for it for Mac OS X. It's going to use the real UART for maybe, or just like log the, the communication. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. But there's this new AVR simulator called Sim AVR uh, by Bus Era, I think the guy is called, um, which looks pretty nice, which has like hardware simulation capabilities where you can actually, you know, like simulate the levels on the, on the, on the UART and then basically simulate the whole interrupt thing. Because when I'm doing the mock object, I don't have any interrupt coming in. It's basically just like calling OS functions. And that's what I'm aiming for, is just like having the real hardware simulated so that I can know that this takes three clock cycles and, and that kind of stuff. So that's work in progress. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, is there any, any other question? I think there's one over there.